good to be with you and uh, share God's Word in just a moment. Uh, let me take a, just a moment and uh, give you about a, a three-minute snapshot of my spiritual journey and then uh, find the book of Joshua. Um, nobody brings Bibles. So open your app or your phone <laughs> or whatever the Word of God comes on in your life. Um, and we're going to look at a remarkable guy for a few moments. And I'm going to talk to you uh, about two words that um, seem to be an oxymoron, uh, and that's embracing obscurity. Okay? Embracing obscurity. I was born and raised in a town called Bakersfield, California. Anybody from Bakersfield? Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> yeah, Buck, Merle, and Dwight. Uh, and so I was born and raised there. Uh, my wife uh, was raised there. Uh, we were not raised in a Christian home, and so we got married. I was 19. She was the ripe old age of 18. Uh, she was four days after 18, and so we had dated three years in high school. And, um, and the best we can figure, when we got married, we were the only two believers in both families. And so we were not raised with this rich, godly heritage <laughs> at all, uh, and, uh, and we began our journey together. Uh, and God has just been remarkably faithful to us. Uh, I pastored in Bakersfield, pastored in Lake Isabella. Anybody been to Lake Isabella at all? All right. The wind blew, right? Uh, loved it up there. Uh, and then uh, in a town, Upland, California. And for the last 11 years, I've been in this ministry, which is director of the Inland Empire Baptist Association. About 235 churches in the Empire that we serve in various capacities. Uh, the vast majority of my time is in a coaching, counseling, friendship relationship with lead pastors. Uh, and our staff does most of the training. So I drink an ungodly amount of coffee uh, on a regular basis. <clears throat> uh, my wife and I were blessed with six children, uh, three of the old-fashioned way, which is not what this lecture is about. Uh, and then God allowed us to adopt three in Lake Isabella. And so we have six children. And we have 14 grandchildren. So when God said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, we thought, we can do that. We can do that. I thought that was a personal command, not just given to mankind. So, you know, context really matters when it comes to Scripture. Uh, and so that is kind of a snapshot of our journey. Use this passage, actually, at the retreat, just really where God got my attention, and then the last since then, just really been drawn to this remarkable man by the name of Joshua. Uh, let's just read the first nine verses. And um, whatever translation you have, I'm going to trust as close to this one. But after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them. The children of Israel, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you. As I said to Moses, from the, land of, from the wilderness of this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, the great sea, toward the going down of the sun, shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide an inheritance, as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, that you may observe to do all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage, do not be afraid nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Amazing passage, an amazing man. Joshua is one of those men in the Bible that's easy to overlook. But he's, a, he's just an incredible example of just a person... A gifted man who just chooses to be faithful and do a work in his life that is so significant when all is said and done, the glory has to go to God and the ripple effects of that life is generational. 
very gifted man who did not mind ministering in obscurity. And God did a work that's absolutely stunning. His task was to follow a leader by the name of Moses. That's some hard shoes to fill. <laughs> that could be a little bit intimidating to follow Moses, a man who stood Pharaoh down face to face, a man who God used to part the Red Seas, a man who walked up to Mount Sinai and personally interacted with God and saw at least a glimpse of what the glory of God looked like as it just passed in front of him. The Ten Commandment, Mount Sinai, Moses. <laughs> Joshua says, oh, by the way, God says, Josh, you get to follow him. That could be a little bit intimidating. And Joshua, here is your, here's your assignment. You're going to take a bunch of non-trained, undermanned, disarmed, complaining Jews and conquer the promised land. Go get him, son. That's a tough person to follow, and that's a tough assignment. And so in this passage, I think God gives him amazing, amazing encouragement. I like God's assurance and promise to Joshua. He says this, as I was with Moses, I'm going to be with you. We're going to find in a moment that Joshua was a first-hand witness to Moses' walk with God. Probably, if not, probably every place you see Moses, or at least the majority, Joshua's with him. The Bible just doesn't really say it. But this is his, his right-hand man. And so, so nobody was a greater witness to the walk that Moses had with God than Joshua himself. He saw that relationship and a high witness, and obviously, as they spoke, an ear witness to what that looked like. The tendency when you read that is to think, okay, God's power will be with Joshua. God's protection, just like I protected Moses, just like I empowered him, I'll be with you. And to a degree, that is true. But there's much more to walking with God than just experiencing God's power on an occasional basis. Listen to what God says about Moses in Exodus 33. He says, so the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. In Numbers 12, Moses got some opposition from Aaron and Miriam. And God aggressively interacted on his behalf. And then God said this to them. I speak with him face to face, even plainly, not in dark saying. And Deuteronomy 34 sums it up. But since then there has not risen in Israel a prophet like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Face to face is a term that indicates intimacy, closeness, knowledge of what the other person is like. When you know someone face to face, you know what that person's like. God's like, this Moses, man, he gets me. <laughs> he understands me face to face. That comes from spending a lot of time with a person, going through life with that person. You, you learn their heart. You understand their priorities. You know their personality. It's a deep and abiding knowledge of what the other person is like. I've been married to my wife for 36 years. I know what makes her tick. I know what makes her ticked. <laughs> and there's a really big difference. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Moses had this amazing, intimate, personal friendship with God. And Joshua had seen that firsthand. He knew what that looked like, what it smelled like, what it felt like. And now God says to him, hey, what, I, what, what you saw me had with Moses, I'm going to have that with you. It's not just my power. 
It's not just my provision. The same way you saw that, that friendship that I had with Moses, Joshua, hey, we're going to have that. I find that incredibly appealing. I find a lot of people want to experience God's power. But Moses reminds us, and Joshua tapped in, there's something that's much more meaningful than experiencing God's power, and that's knowing God. And not just knowing the facts about God or the the theology about God, but going through life every day with God. And in that, God reveals Himself to us, and we understand His personality, His ways, and His character. And it's not just a theological knowledge of God, it's an intimate, daily, personal experience. And that far exceeds just experiencing, excuse me, the power. I'm not trying to minimize the power of God, but intimacy exceeds power. And so I think that's very encouraging to Joshua. He understood what that looked like. We'll spend no time on this to speak of. But it does tell him, I want you to spend time in my word and obey all of it. Joshua. So meditate in my word day and night. By the way, he had five books to choose from. He had the Pentateuch. Can you... <laughs> I mean, I, I'll risk being really unspiritual. Those are hard books to spend a lot of time in. <laughs> he didn't have Phil, Philippians and <laughs> Romans, <laughs> Hebrews and Psalms. He had like five books to choose from <laughs> that we know them. Well, five books. I'm not even wrong on that. It's close to the, just the Pentateuch. Just a very small portion. That little small portion, the law, you, you're to live in that day and night. Meditate on it. I don't know if I told the men or not, but I was thinking, as I thought what he was saying to Joshua, and he also, you know, don't turn to the right hand or the left, don't, just do things the way I tell you, Joshua, you'll be fine. And I've been telling, I was telling some people lately, and maybe my daughters, um, boy, I've been saved, I'm 55, I got saved at 15, so 40 years of walking um, with Christ, or really Christ tolerating me. <laughs> But I was telling, you know, in, in those 40 years of spending time with God, there's a phrase I have never heard from God. Here's what God has never said to me. Daryl, what do you think? <laughs> never once <laughs> solicited my opinion on anything. It's Daryl, here's what we're going to do. Get to know my character and hang on. It's going to be exciting. You get to know me and spend time, Joshua. I also think it's incredibly encouraging in this charge to Joshua how personal the charge is and how God defines success in Joshua's life. Verse 3, I have given you. Verse 5, no man can stand before you. I will be with you. I will not forsake you. You will prosper. I will bless you. I will make your way prosperous. This is not given to Israel. This is given to Joshua. It's a very personal charge. Reminds us of God's measure of successfulness in our lives. And the measurement of God in our lives of success is personal faithfulness. Personal faithfulness. When I was in school... I hated group projects. Anybody else? Hated them. Because there's always one person who leached off the group, right? But we all got the same grade. And because we wanted to have good grades and he didn't care, we had to do all the extra work. God says, Joshua, this is no group project. (laughs) You be faithful to me. You do what I ask. You do what I say. And I will bless you. And I will prosper you. I think that was really good news to Joshua. He had seen firsthand how they had followed Moses. (laughs) It hadn't been so pretty at times. In fact, he spent four decades paying for a sin he didn't commit. Right? He wanted to go in and take the land. 
So he spent four decades of his life paying for a decision that he did not want the people to make. And you don't see no bitterness or resentment. It's a completely different message. But he had seen how they were prone to complain. He'd seen how they oftentimes voted or wanted to vote for a new leader. He had seen how well they followed Moses. And God's like, yeah, I know what they're like too, Joshua. <laughs> I know what they're like. And, and so the measure of success in your life does not depend on how they follow me. It depends on how you follow me. They may or may not obey. Look at their history. <laughs> Look at their track record. <laughs> they may or may not follow you. They may or may not follow me. But I will not determine success in your life on based on how others extend their free will. It's how you use your free will. And if you will follow me, if you'll stick your nose in my book, if you'll obey my word, if you will be personally faithful, then, son, I'm going to bless you. And I will make your way prosperous. It is important in a world that judges results based on, a world that judges success based on results, to realize that God does not. It says in Corinthians, it's required in a steward that one be found faithful. 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 And in that verse, Paul says, and not faithfulness by man's measure, or Paul says, not even by my own measurement. Faithfulness by the measurements of God. Faithful. God said to Joshua, you got a tough assignment. They may or may not tap in. But if you are faithful to me, I will bless you. Counteracts, by the way, results can be misleading. Amen? Example, parenting. You can be a great parent and raise kids who make horrendous choices. And you can be a terrible parent and raise kids who turn out wonderfully. Amen? Results can be misleading. And in all honesty, most of the results are out of our hands. But personal faithfulness is not. That's how God measures success. It also counters a trap we fall into. I'll quit moving. <laughs> it also counters a trap we fall into as believers. Here's this weird idea we have. If I get more faithful to God, those around me will make better choices. No, they won't. Didn't work for Moses. Didn't really work all that well for Jesus. <laughs> Not everybody made big choices around him. But we get sucked into that. And really what we're saying is that God, if I get closer to you, you'll violate people's free will. God's like, no, I won't. I'll just strengthen you. I will bless you. I'll give you the ability to handle that. So if my boss is an idiot, I say, God, I'll get close to you. He'll still be an idiot. I can just handle it better. Amen? <laughs> but we get drawn into that as believers. It's not true. Here's what God says. If you will just be personally faithful to me in your marriage, in your friendships, in your ministry, at your job, whatever, and whatever assignments I give you, if in those assignments you will just be personally faithful in that, then I will bless you from his perspective. I will prosper you as God defines prosperity. I will be with you. I think that was great news to Joshua. <laughs> I think Joshua went, Whew, boy, am I glad to hear that. Because <laughs> if my success depends on them obeying leaders, <laughs> This is not looking so good. <laughs> so I think there was a huge sigh of relief when God said, Hey, son, you walk close to me, I'll bless you. Then the part that just really spoke to me was how God prepared Joshua for this task. Wow, 
two words in verse 1. Moses, assistant. Those two words describe four decades of Joshua's life. Forty years. This is a highly gifted, highly skilled, competent man. And for four decades... He is simply Moses' assistant. That's not even an impressive title. (laughs) It's that administrative assistant. It's pretty cool. Executive assistant. Deliverer pro temp. (laughs) Doesn't even look good on a business card. Joshua, Moses' assistant. Seriously? And for four decades... Here's his job description from God. Help Moses out today. He's just to get up every day and say to Moses, how can I help you today? That was his job description. For four decades. You know the first time we see him is in Exodus 17. And Moses, God... God fights battles rather differently. Have you noticed that? You march around the city, scream real loud. I mean, just, <laughs> he has some very interesting battle strategies. Well, this one, Moses on the hill, Israel's in the valley, his arms are up, they win. His arms go down, they begin to lose. I'm sure Patton would have loved that strategy. <laughs> and so, you know, his arms are getting heavy, and Moses and her come alongside him and lift his arm. And I've heard message after message after message on those three guys, and those three guys in command. You know where Joshua was? Operations. <laughs> he was down in the valley. He's with the dirt, with the dust, leading the armies. Because here's what I think happened that morning. Joshua, or Moses, what do you need to do? I need you to lead the armies to battle. And so... We'll be up on the hill, and we'll get all the messages and all the really cool me- Come alongside your pastor and lift up their arms. And they'll get all the really cool messages, but you be down in the dirt, the grime, where all the risk is at. I just need someone to lead the army today, Joshua. Yes, sir. Not I'm not skilled, not I'm not gifted, not I can't do it. Yes, sir. That's what a good assistant does. And that's the first time we see him in Scripture. We had a glimpse of him as he goes up and down with Mount Sinai, at Moses at Mount Sinai. You rarely see him early on, but he's everywhere early on. Every now and then Moses gave him a big assignment. Every now and then. Occasionally. But for the most part, how can I help you today? Probably not real impressive to other people. I wonder if they made fun of him behind his back. There is Moses. There's his dog. I hate the phrase, there's his lackey. I hate that one. (laughs) But in that time, he was prepared and he was proved. Embracing obscurity. That's what Joshua did. He just did what God asked him each day, best he could. It doesn't appear he were not being noticed, or promoted, our titles, our prestige. I wrote down, he's one of those people who are seen but not really noticed. For a while, I umpired baseball. A good umpire is seen, but not noticed. Amen? You go to a baseball game, if they're a good umpire, you know, I know they were there. They helped the game go forward, they were necessary, but you don't notice umpires if they're good. You notice them if they are bad. But a good umpire is seen, he's necessary. That's Joshua. 
seen, noticed, really not seen and necessary. He's okay with that. And, and it appears he did that for at least 40 years. So I learned that when I come to the point where I do my best for God regardless of the assignment and I don't care if I get noticed or not and I just faithfully serve regardless of the assignment, big or small, usually small, God prepares me, He proves me and it sets Him up to do a work in my life it can only be ascribed to him. It can have generational impact. So her name is Ruth Cocken. Here's the words that she writes. You know, Lord, how I serve you with great, emo with great emotional fervor in the limelight. You know how eagerly I speak for you at the women's club. You know I effervesce for you when I promote you in front of the fellowship group. You know my genuine enthusiasm at the Bible study. But how would I react, I wonder, if you pointed to a basin of water and asked me to wash the callous feet of a bent and wrinkled old woman day after day, month after month, in a room where nobody saw and nobody knew. Could I embrace obscurity? Could I do my best for you, knowing that nobody would ever know that I did my best for you? Could I give you my eye, knowing that nobody would ever know how much of my all I gave you? Do I resist and reject and despise obscurity? <laughs> or do I embrace it? I'm a pastor. I'm a professor. I love giving homework. <laughs> it's just in my DNA. <laughs> when it comes to homework, I say it's more blessed to give than receive. <laughs> Let me give you an assignment. this week. Do something really meaningful for someone else. I mean meaningful for them. But in a way that there's no way they'll ever know it was you. And don't tell anybody it was you. Embrace obscurity. I'll finish with this. It's my privilege to, preach, to teach young preachers at Cal Baptist. Young preachers, all preachers, but young preachers struggle with pride because we build them up and we fill them full of knowledge and wonder why they struggle with pride. Like, <laughs> give me a break. And so they just struggle with arrogance. So I, wanted to, I, want, I gave them this assignment because I want them to understand just the pure joy of serving God just for the pure joy of serving God. And so I said, I want you guys to do something for a student this week, and just to say, no, tell anybody, da 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 da, da. So the next week, I asked, I said, how'd that make you feel? They said, man, it was really hard. It was hard not to kind of hint to someone that I had done. It was hard not to, you know, oh, I was over at John's house, and I, I did his homework for him. I mean, just, they said it was, it was harder than we thought it would be to just do something and not find a way to brag about it. They said, and it kind of felt really good. Well, one guy, he said, Pat, he says, Professor, I've got to tell you what happened. He said, I did something very meaningful for one of the dorm students down the dorm from me. He goes, and he was telling a group of us about it and how much it blessed him, and then my roommate took credit for it. <laughs> and I couldn't say anything. <laughs> you know what? That happens. Sometimes we do our best for God and someone else takes the credit. Here's the Greek word for that. So what? 
So what? So what? Big deal. God knows. God knows. That's who blesses. That's who prospers. That's who he reveals. That's where intimacy matters. Yeah, sometimes others take the credit or get the credit. So what? When I can embrace obscurity and allow God to train me in that obscurity, it positions me for him to do a work in my life that will outlive my life. That's what matters. Amen? Thank you for letting me speak to you. God bless you.